Welcome to episode number 166 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today we have Brandon Cobb. Now, Brandon is a marketing executive who's focused on driving profits in the organizations that he works with. Now, he knows that companies are only as strong as their people, and his career includes uh, leading teams of up to 500 members, fostering 100% retention during major organizational changes, and creating a culture of collaboration and shared success. He ensures that teams of the information tools and support for success will provide coaching and mentoring. Now, he has a uh, extensive CV and has done some really remarkable things in his uh, career. And a couple of highlights include that he orchestrated successful campaigns for iconic brands such as Jaguar, Land Rover, HP, Intel, uh, Corcoran, Global Living. And he's also been the recipient of congratulatory notes from Disney chairman and HBO executives. So uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to the show today, Brandon. Welcome. Thank you very much. And 166 episode, that's uh, quite a few. So impressive on your part as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, someone did tell me the other day that, uh, you know, only 1% of podcasters ever get beyond 100%, 100 episodes. So uh, I, I guess I fit into that category, which is, is great. And I owe that to some amazing guests that we've had on the show, uh, you know, such as yourself. Now, uh, I was very surprised when I jumped on the call with you today, looking at your CV and your experience, you've accomplished so much, but of course, you're still at a reasonably young age for your career. You still have a lot of time in, in front of you. So maybe tell us about some of these career highlights. How have you been able to have such an impact on these very well-known brands uh, and, and receive congratulatory notes from senior people like that at such an early age? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm 34. I've been doing a variety of marketing jobs since age 19. And uh, with that, you know, everything just compounds and, and where my career goals are from here are, are much higher than and, and much bigger goals than anything I've accomplished so far. So uh, I hope to continue that momentum. Now, um, where I've, I've helped some of these brands in the past are uh, specifically those ones that you mentioned, Jaguar, Land Rover, HP, Intel. This was with a, uh, an organization called Not Impossible Labs, and they, uh, they specialized on making the impossible possible um, by basically um, partnering with these brands to uh, use their resources and their brand reach to uh, show the world what can be done from a medical aspect with just tinkering and creating new solutions at a low cost. And so like, for example, um, we 3D printed prosthetic arms uh, that was in partnership with Intel in the Sudan and Africa. Um, we, uh, th th they created a, the ability for a guy to um, speak to his wife who had ALS um, and tell her he loved her again uh, through a computer system. And so that was uh, with HP. Jaguar Land Rover was um, rehabilitating. We partnered with a, a high school robotics class uh, in Los Angeles. And this was uh, basically helping people with cerebral palsy rehabilitate to a normal gait or walking pattern. And we did other things like Beats by Dre. It was uh, helping people who were deaf experience music through vibration. So it was a company. It's a very, very interesting company. You can look them up, notimpossible.com. Um, you know, but beyond that, uh, I've helped so many other companies. So it's like, okay, well, how did I get the congratula uh, congratulation notes from Disney's chairman um, and uh, some HBO executives? Well, the way that occurred was from um, basically doing an email marketing campaign that we took a database of all the different uh, executives in the entertainment industry, trying to, at that time, jumpstart some film and movie projects. And so... Um, it's a chicken and the egg because you have to have talent on board to attract investors. And if you don't have investors on board, it's hard to attract talent. So basically like through this email campaign, we just set up a lot of meetings across the industry and started building synergy. And it was like putting together pieces of a puzzle and just connecting the dots. And then from there um, we basically, you know, it was a very independent company um, raised $4 million, uh, produced seven movies. So, you know, these were pretty low budget movies, uh, seven movies across $4 million. But nevertheless, um, that is what basically uh, some of these industry executives found impressive. So as the, the um, you know, as those movies started releasing on the different streaming platforms through various distribution, uh, some of the executives in the industry you know, they responded with with how impressed they were, had meetings as well, 
like with HBO executives and different things on, on possibly creating some pilots and, and whatnot. Um, so that was that. And then, uh, you know, you mentioned Corcoran global living. Um, so I, I came down here to San Diego is a, a better quality of life, uh, basically marketing in the real estate industry. And it's been a, a ride ever since. And, and, um, now I'm looking, uh, on to, to many, many other new and exciting things right now. So. Wow. Uh, lots of lots of amazing things to happen there. And to pull together that kind of resourcing and get those kind of networks and connections, it's it's pretty impressive. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who would love to be able to reach out to uh, some of these people who are maybe high up hard to get to and build relationships and start a business with them. So what, what tips do you have for uh, any marketers listening or any business owners listening who you know want to get in contact with a certain group and they find it hard to get in front of them? Yeah, I think just find a way to be different, find a way to um, stand out. They probably get so many different emails, so many different uh, mail, so, uh, traditional mail, uh, so many different advertisements. So it's like, how can you, when you get that one second to be in front of them, how do you just catch their attention and be different and try to uh, get them to open your email or open your mail or, you know, and there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I think some of it is a numbers game. Um, if you're, you're, you're mass reaching out to, to people, you're, you're naturally going to get responses from some that are going to surprise you in the best of ways. Um, but also, uh, you know, I guess if it's email, pay attention to your subject line. If it's, um, if it's mail, I, I find it very interesting, like uh, when something comes in a UPS or yeah, a UPS package or a FedEx package, well, of course, you're going to kind of open that package versus some other type of mail. But then it's just but but that actually, I think um, so there's it's this think of you as a, a consumer and how you're going to feel getting any of this as well, because like if you get a FedEx pa package, you open it up and then it's junk mail inside. It's going to get you to open the package then you're probably going to be let down when you open the package. So um, it's a balance of uh, trying to get them to open and then trying to create excitement once they do open. So, Okay. And and what did you do specifically then with these execs? Because as you say, they will receive a lot of attention, a lot of people vying for their, uh, you know, their interest. And so not only did you get them to open the email or the UPS package, but then actually there was something meaty enough that made them say, yes, let's book a meeting. I think it's a lot of statistics, a lot of numbers and showing um, result, not just putting it in words, but putting it in numbers. You know, there's uh, uh, anybody can say anything, but numbers are, are, are proof. Um, and so uh, I think that's, that's probably for executives, what grabs their attention it tends to be his numbers. And, and you hear that with resume writing and different things too. It's like, you know, not, don't just say, uh, don't just say what your responsibilities are, but say what you accomplish and what you, you know, and, and that grabs attention. So it certainly does. Uh, when I saw your bio and your bullet points, it was very clear on that. You know, the fact that you, you know, raised 4 million, you did X number of films, you unified, you know, X number of companies, you made this percent improvement, this amount of revenue, and it jumps out. These are the things that capture your attention. So uh, you're not just talking theory here. You're, you're really using it, which I, which I love. And the bit I want to capture there is that you've used data to really capture the attention of these senior executives. Now, data uh, by default isn't something coming from you or your organization. Presumably, it's some analysis or data from an external party. So it's uh, it's not you saying it. It's look here's what's happening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the world is going more and more data driven every day, and and being a data data driven marketer, not just from a decision making purpose, but also using data and your uh, convincing of of potential clients is is so so important. So that that one tip in itself could be worth uh, the whole episode if you're not using more data in your uh you know in in what you're, you're marketing then there's value in that uh and i think an earlier episode uh, probably actually right back to episode number two amanda holmes from chet holmes international was, was sharing a similar point um and she she of course was saying look, let's use that data to point out why why people should be taking action why they should be moving forwards uh with you and include that as part of your uh, your core story so if you haven't listened to episode number two then uh that really dovetails very well with what brandon is saying now brandon 
Uh, since you've had such an accomplished career already, where's your time and energy these days? What are you putting your focus on? Yeah, so, you know, for the year of 2022, I was uh, interim chief marketing officer for several startups. Um, I'm actually right now consulting with a, uh, a marketing agency out of India. Um, they offer a variety of, of marketing services. And, uh, you know, part of that is just crossing borders and, and trying to gain trust uh, with some U.S. clientele that they can do it probably at a, a more affordable rate and, and just as good a quality as what we're doing here. Um, you know, when I did the MBA, we always um, talked about uh, how people sometimes can fear, and this is, tends to go to the manufacturing side of things, but tends to fear like outsourcing of things. Well, you know, and we were always told, don't fear outsourcing because all it does, or AI now, right? Like AI coming in, taking over some 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 jobs. Don't fear it because all it does is open you up to new opportunities and new jobs and new jobs are created around it. So as a result, um, uh, you know, we'd like to take some of the, the busy work off of marketers here through the U.S., um, provide a, a good quality uh, job for them, and, um, and then allow them to start focusing more on their strategy and different things like that. So hey, it's so important and leveraging, you know, the skills and abilities in other countries, you know, India, here in Australia, typically, we, we work a lot with Philippines, you know, given that they have highly skilled people there, and you know, the, the cost differential from paying, you know, a local uh, employee versus one over there, it, it actually can save a lot of money for the organization. So you're, you're actively helping marketers to get some of that busy work off of their plates so that they can free themselves up for the strategy. What, what impact is that having? How are you seeing that make a difference to the customers that you work with? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it uplifts everybody, right? It uplifts the, the uh, people overseas that are doing, getting those, those jobs. It uplifts the people here to um, uh, just, just be able to uh, improve their, their bottom line. So it's not, I mean, you're improving both the top line and the bottom line. Cause if you, you uh, find ways of B2B uh, like lead generation, for example, well, as long as it's returning on investment, it's going to provide you more and more um, revenue to do other things. But if you're keeping an eye on costs and you're making sure you're, you're using the most economical um, uh, organizations that, that are still providing a return there is it's going to uh, help your bottom line as well. And I think, um, I mean, I think that's where marketing's going is just the, the need to uh, prove return on investment. I'm actually like, uh, a, a, another side thing is like doing a lot of focus on attribution right now and how you properly attribute everything. So I think the the world is going where we need to prove ourselves as marketers w with return on investment. And, and so uh, I think that's what we're doing now with this, this agency, this marketing agency I'm talking about beyond that. Um, I mean, I'm also teaching a couple of marketing MBA classes right now. Uh, so I, there's an AACSB accredited school. You, you mentioned you're in Australia, um, uh, Kevin. So they're actually in, uh, have you heard of, uh, Deakin university? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. So at Deakin university, I'm teaching a, uh, marketing management one and a marketing management two course. Um, and, uh, so that's an AACSB accredited school. And I'm also teaching a course with Liverpool business school in, uh, U the UK, this is through uh, actually another Indian organization called the uh, Upgrad, and they've got um, global programs uh, with some of these universities across the world. So, and that was Upgrad. Upgrad, yeah, U P G R A D. Okay, Upgrad, that's awesome. You mentioned some really powerful things there. You know, marketing. You know, marketers. We you know we should be able to prove the return on investment. And I've seen this from the other side with my clients. You know, it was very easy for us to spend money on marketing with an agency but not always easy to see the benefit or the impact that's having. So the fact that you're focusing on making sure the clients see the ROI, it's great. When people can see that, they're going to want to work with you longer, you know, and invest more money in the marketing. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions for you, and they're slightly different. You mentioned something about attribution. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, I know you're going to say, like, man, you're a busy, busy guy because, uh, you know, I'm putting kind of uh, – pretty much a full-time effort towards the, the Indian agency right now. But um, I'm also consulting on the, you know, teaching that class. I'm consulting a local real estate company now on, on a few things. But in addition, 
uh, this year I'm, I'm going to be starting, um, I've already been accepted to several schools for it, a, a doctorate of business administration. So it's a step up from the MBA. Um, and uh, it's basically a little more research focused than the, the MBA. And so um, my whole project around that is going to be on attribution. So when I say attribution, what I mean here is, um, you know, we we're very good as marketers at tracking, uh, hey, I ran this Google ad and it created this lead and that lead went off to go ahead and close. And I can attribute that from a last touch point standpoint that this Google ad generated this lead and generated that close. It's a little more difficult to generate or to uh, attribute the first touch point. Um, so, okay, this Google lead brought it to our website. They didn't um, submit their information there, but then they saw our other ads. They looked at our social media. Uh, later, they, they did some research. They later came back and, uh, and submitted their information. And so it's difficult, It's uh, but it, you can, it still can be done on the first touch point. It's very difficult to do the multi-touch point attribution where, okay, well, I'm going to give credit so much to social media, so much to the radio ad, so much to the TV ad, so much to the billboard, you know, and, and how did that all influence together the, the person ultimately making a purchase? Um, so what I mean by this and what I'm, I'm very interested right now in, uh, pers you know, in, in, in being able to do is, is understanding when you, I, so I, 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 I call it, we look at things in a single layered format right now. I'd like to look at things much more in a multi-layered format in a 3D. So uh, with this being said, um, I, wh what I'd like to do is, is start to be able to understand, okay, and I'll make it simple here with three variables. We've got a TV ad, we've got a radio ad, we've got a social media ad. If I pull out the radio ad, what's it do to the total revenue? If I put the radio ad back in, what's it do to the total revenue? If I pull out the social media ad, so, you know, doing the different combinations there, just on a few variables, but now let's take it later. If you, if a system's created for this, where there's 50 variables and you're, you're choosing what to inject, what to deject from the marketing mix. So um, this is what I mean is, is uh, creating a, uh, very multi-layered way of, of looking at uh, marketing, that integrated marketing approach, but being able to credit all the different channels in that integrated approach at different levels um, to be able to know where to put your marketing spend. I can really see the value of that. The number of times uh, I work with my clients and you know they tell me about a great result or something that's gone well, and I'm like, great. Let's understand where did that income come from? What was the marketing that worked that? And then we can put more energy, more effort into that. And it's it's challenging for them to know exactly where it came from. Sometimes it's obvious it came from a social media post. Sometimes it's obvious it came from a paid ad they did. Uh, sometimes, but, you know, they can't always track back, you know, what was the driver of the increase in revenue. And that, if we can nail that, then, of course, we can put more energy, more effort into that. So I really get the value of that. What do, what do you hope will be the outcome of this? Do you think you're going to build some kind of system or software to enable businesses to understand their multi-touch point attribution? Yeah, well, I was going to say, and, and maybe it's the podcast you're doing is what generates the revenue. It's always, it's always the podcast. <laughs> podcast rocks. <laughs> but... Uh, so what, what my, my purpose of like, how do you put this to use? And, and the reason why I, I feel this is, is needed is because, um, you go to, as a, as a CMO, you go to a CFO or you go to a CEO or a CEO depending, and you're trying to pitch this campaign or this, you know, uh, go to market strategy or whatever it may be. A lot of times what that marketing mix is going to be is strictly off the intuition of what the marketer uh, past experience feels will get, achieve the result you want. Now, that's going to take a lot of uh, trust from the CFO, from the CEO to give you to trust that what you feel as an intuition is actually going to prove results. So what? I, so the, the uh, practicality of this is that um, if you're able to show it with data, what is statistically most likely to happen with each each element, then um, and how the synergy is created, then uh, it takes away, it makes the marketer's job easier to convince CFOs, CEOs, 
to take on new initiatives, give you new budgets, uh, et cetera. So um, how, what do I hope to have uh, as, a, as an end format for that? Um, I mean, I, I would assume some type of uh, possibly a simulation of sorts, like, um, you know, I, there's an interesting like Harvard business, uh, we use it in the marketing class that I, I teach, um, a Harvard business simulation that is, um, you've got like 50 variable points on the the four P's of marketing, the product, the price, the place, the promotion, and you're you're changing all the, where you're investing in the product, what kind of price you're setting, where you want to target, like, you know, where you want to be uh, known to be, have a unique uh, differentiator um, or your, your competitive advantage. And then uh, on the promotion, like how many salespeople you have out in the field or, or what promotions you're doing with paid advertising. And all of this affects then the results. So it's a simulation. So I, I plan to probably take kind of that uh, computer simulated approach, but put it in um, more specifically just on the marketing uh, promotional channels, specifically the, the promotional P of marketing, the promotional channels, and, and just a hyper-focused simulation on that. Sounds very interesting, and uh, I really look forward to hearing the result of your PhD once you uh, you complete this. It sounds like it could be uh, creating something very valuable that uh, every business that invests in marketing would would really get a lot of uh, a lot of use from. Now, uh, there was one other question I had, which I want to loop back to. You mentioned about the outsourcing to India. Uh, I know sometimes business owners, particularly uh, you know, in an earlier stage of their you know career, may have a challenge in letting go of some of the tasks and act activities and handing it over to other people, particularly if they're in a, another country. So, what what are your thoughts on that? How can business owners uh, you know more easily embrace outsourcing? Yeah, I think it's a um, that that is it's it's all driven by fear and it's. Um, it, it's getting over number one, the fear that if you um, give away this job, that it's going to, you're going to have no purpose for your own job. Or um, it's the fear of uh, a lack of trust across international borders. It's a fear of, um, uh, you know, just, yeah, I mean, relying on people that you've never met in person in general. Um, and so how do you get over that fear? Uh, I would say, you know, number one, understanding that uh, I'm only going to, I mean, me, myself, I've been a marketer here in house in the U S and uh, many, um, you know, uh, capacities. And, and so if I'm, uh, I'm putting my stamp of approval on their quality of work, their, uh, employee skill set, quick turnarounds, these kind of things, number one, hopefully me as being local can, can build a bridge to that trust a little bit. That's one. Um, number two, I think you do it in some trials. Like you don't just give the whole farm away. You do it in bit by bit. And as you start to see the return uh, or you start to see it work, then, um, you know, you can do more and more. Secondly, or I mean, third, I guess, is uh, that I think you uh, in many ways uh, have the opportunity to be a generalist. I, I once read a very interesting book compares generalists and specialists and there's pros and cons to both. You can make a lot of money being either or, but if you are more of a generalist and now you, you, you picture yourself as just putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and you don't have to know a lot about any one specialty, but you have to know a little bit about it all and how it all glues together. That's your role as a business owner. That's your role as a CEO or, or a, a chief marketing officer in this case is to put all the different specialties together and maximize their efforts. And so um, I think that's where I'm saying you outsource one thing and it actually gives you a better job because now you're the, the, the umbrella to it all. So. I love that. What a uh, a great metaphor to be the umbrella. You're bringing together all the different pieces and making sure they're optimized and they're maximized and working together. And that uh, outsourcing overseas can be one very leveraged part of that. Uh, Brandon, so much wisdom and knowledge coming already. Uh, the, the topic of the show is life-changing questions. And we like to say that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves really impacts the quality of the life that we lead. So with that being true, I wonder what's one question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the clients that you serve? Yeah. Um, so I always tend to ask, you know, how are you going to live your life without regrets? What, what decisions could you make that would 
allow you to live without regrets. I mean, for me personally, some of that is I, you know, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, I decided to move to California. A lot of people didn't want me to, or, or didn't think it was the best choice for me to move to California and this and that. But I can tell you by moving to California, I mean, it, it opened up so many opportunities that would I have had in, in Ohio possibly, but um, all I can say is there's been a lot of opportunities in California, both from career standpoint, from uh, meeting diverse people and from meeting the, the love of my life um, and uh, so many other things. So I, I'm very satisfied. You know, I didn't, um, I knew I would regret it if I didn't go, go do that. And then it's like, okay, well, then I was up in LA and I was doing uh, marketing in the, the film industry. And, you know, that's a shiny object. That's a shiny, glittery industry. Uh, on the outside, it's not um, super shiny and glittery necessarily um, when you're you're deep into it. But uh, what I'll say is that you know I pivoted, I adjusted, I to, to come down here to San Diego to make more money. To because um, uh, because some of this is like okay, are you going to pursue? Some people say pursue your passion, and uh, I think there's some truth to that. But you also have to think like, um, are you good at your passion, and are you able to make good money at your passion, and uh, regardless of those answers, if the, the answer is that you're going to regret life, if you don't just keep pursuing your passion full speed, well then do it. But if, if part of your life is going to really grow from making more money or from um, doing something that you're really good at, uh, maybe you don't like as much, uh, would you regret that opportunity to make uh, your life better in some other ways? And it, and if so, then you got to go do that. So I think just like really balancing um, what's going to make you happy, what's going to um, uh, allow you to live without regret. And um, a couple other points is I think just like, you know, working on behalf of, of shareholders, best interests always. So, um, you know, you'll, you'll be put in your career in different situations where um whether it's it's people working for the company, whether it's the shareholders themselves who um, uh, sometimes, you know, may not always uh, be making decisions that's in their best interest. And, and if you're, if, if you truly believe, I mean, you could be wrong. I could be wrong a lot of times too. But if you truly believe that you're giving advice, you're there to, con to consult, to advise, to, to work on behalf of the shareholders' interests, then you've got a financial duty to um, tell them whatever is going to be or your colleagues, your bosses, whoever you have a financial duty to tell them what is going to be best for the business. And um, I think by doing that, uh, hopefully you can go to sleep at night that you've given your best is go, go to sleep and, and sleep well at night that you've given your best. You've given an honest, hard, hard working effort. Um, and you've given the best you have. And I think that's probably for me beyond all that decision making of what you're going to do. I think just basically being uh, giving your all and giving your best in every scenario is how you live without regrets. I love that. Very crystal clear. And if you go to bed at night and you don't feel as though you have given your best in that scenario, then you may be regretting that because the outcome could have been you know, more positive. There could have been a better result there. I, I love that that question really drives uh, you know, you personally to be, uh, you know, be delivering at the highest standard that you can. So that's a really, and, really great question. And if you don't mind, what I, mm -hmm. I'll say too is, you know, I, I believe that if I, if I fail because of a lack of talent, like that's something I can live with. If I fail because of a lack of effort, I cannot live with that. So um, that, yeah, just, just trying and giving your best. Okay. I, I love that frame. Because you're right, you know, maybe we don't have the talent or the skills right now, but we can go away and, and build that skill and build that muscle. But if it's because Matt didn't bother to put the effort in, then of course, yeah, that, that's going to hurt. That's really going to hurt. Now, Brandon, one thing I recognize about you is you have so many things happening. You accomplished so much in your career already, and I can tell there's so much more on the horizon, particularly with what you're doing with the outsourcing company, with your PhD coming up, and, and no doubt a bazillion other things as well. For you to be accomplishing all of these things, you clearly have some habits and rituals that have allowed you to uh, to do so much in a shorter period of time. So I wonder if you could tell us uh, what are some of these habits and rituals that have allowed you to, to do that? Yeah, so... 
I, you know, I like to write, I, I, I once read a book called the, um, the art of productivity. It's a pretty good book. You probably can Google it and, and find it. And, um, I think one of the things I picked up from that was just like, write to do lists, get it out of your head and then move on and not just be thinking about it anymore. Cause when you get it out of your, your mental, uh, uh, it's it's not taking up room of of trying to remember that trying to remember that now it's now you you've opened up your brain to think about many other things and so another thing about that though is that like um and i've heard different scenarios on this but it's like okay well if it takes over 2 minutes file it and come back and do all those files at the same time if it takes under 2 minutes always get it done right away because it's too much effort to keep thinking about something that takes less than 2 minutes um now I, I, yeah, and I I think um, <clears throat> just I th I think also that or it's 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 true also that deciding not to do something now is a decision in itself. So you can decide, hey, I'm going to not if you can if you're unable to make the decision, or you don't have all the data yet. Okay, I'm deciding to revisit this decision later, and. Um, that's a decision in itself. And I think those habits have helped me beyond that, just like continual learning. Um, you know, I just read uh, some Harvard business review must, must reads. And then probably my favorite books are like the mutable laws of marketing and branding. Um, and just finding sources of knowledge that uh, supersede any changes that we're going in the world, but that like will always for the most part apply so there's a few very powerful uh, lessons in there and so uh, just let me capture the books you said you said the art of productivity the immutable laws of marketing and branding and of course harvard business reviews uh, have really helped you with that but the, the key piece and i love what you said there was uh, get out of your head when we have things going around in our head it can interrupt things and you know, stay in our mind but if we get it down on paper and then we can prioritize them and, and go from there and if it's going to take two minutes to do, nail it out of the way. If it's longer than that, potentially you can park it and, and do all those pieces together. Some very valuable uh, tips and uh, wisdom there. Uh, Brandon, one other thing that I really love to, to hear about is your bucket list. Is there something that you still have on your, you know, your mind that you want to accomplish in the future that you haven't gotten to do yet? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd love to be a, a continue to be a, chief marketing officer at larger companies at, uh, you know, big budgets, well-resourced um, that are making a larger impact um, by reaching a larger consumer base. So I think a lot of that is, is just, um, you know, uh, level of, of companies. So that's one thing um, I've learned so much from everything I've done so far. And I, I, I've worked for some pretty big companies as well, but it's just, um, continuing to do it at a, a, a more competitive scale. Um, from there though, I'd like to, uh, be, uh, ideally, I mean, maybe like run a company one day, be a CEO of a company or a, a president of a company. And then I think at the end of my career, uh, I'd like to take all the different business experiences I've had, all the challenges and obstacles have had overcome uh, along the way. And, um, and basically just kind of uh, bring that knowledge back out into the world by probably, te probably teaching at that point or, or writing a book of my own um, and uh, giving that knowledge back. So I think right now I'm like, I'm still in the stage of like consuming, 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 but at some point it will be, uh, releasing that back out so and and hopefully that will help the next generations go a step further i love that very clear uh generational perspective there and uh you know you're still learning still growing and you know you still have a lot to add already now the uh, students at liverpool or deacon are going to be getting a lot of value from you i can tell now for any of our listeners who wants to get in contact with you i know you very kindly give me your uh, linkedin page here so wherever you're listening you feel free to click in the uh in the show notes there and you'll be able to catch hold of Brandon there. Uh, is there any uh, anywhere else that you'd like people to go and visit or anything else that uh, you'd, uh, you'd like to share on today's episode? I mean, feel free. You can email me at Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-E-N. It is with the E. So B-R-A-N-D-E-N at marketingexec.us. 
Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You know, if you just want to bounce some ideas around or uh, if you have a, a consulting need, um, feel free to reach out and, and we can uh, arrange a meeting. Brandon, you've been uh, really great today. So much, so much value in today's episode. So thank you so much for your time and energy. Thank you so much. It's uh, enjoy your show and, and thank you to the audience. So.